Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alright, isn't this the uh, tongues speaking service? We have an interpreter in the front. I think it's biblically okay, no. Uh, my name is Nabil Qureshi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, that was the traditional Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, wa rahmatullahi, and the mercy of God, wa barakatuhu, and his blessings. And so if a Muslim ever approaches you with that, feel free to say, and peace be upon you as well, or wa alaikum salam. Um, so I'm just so glad to be here. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Uh, when I, whenever I'm here at Cherry Hills, I just I really feel the love, the Christian love. I feel the the joy and the peace. And so it's just an honor whenever I'm invited back to to share and to minister uh, that I'd be able to pour into the congregation. Uh, when I was asked to speak this time, it was uh, the title of the topic was told to me: Why Islam? So uh, what I took that to mean is. Why should we engage Islam? Why should we engage Muslims? Islam is the name of the faith and the people are Muslims. So why should we engage Muslims? Why should we understand Islam so that we can share the gospel with them? And uh, what I want to do today is to share with you my story, tell you what life was like for me growing up as a Muslim, uh, what it was that affected the change in me and why it's so very important that we should engage Muslims and engage Islam. So I was raised uh, here in the United States. My parents are from Pakistan. Actually, my mom was born in Indonesia. Um, she is Pakistani, but she was in Indonesia uh, because my grandfather, so her father, was a lifelong missionary in Indonesia. So he spent his whole life preaching Islam in Indonesia. And her mother, so now my grandmother, was born in Uganda because her father spent his whole life preaching Islam in Uganda. So I have come from a line of Muslim missionaries and it's, been, it's very, very important to my family to, to really preach Islam and to engage the Muslim lifestyle. Uh, my father and my mother came here because the United States is the land of opportunity. Our sect of Islam was highly persecuted by other sects. Um, so Islam is not monolithic. It's not one big, everyone's Muslim, they're all the same. They're all very different. Um, and our sect was persecuted by other sects. And so they came here to the United States for freedom, for opportunity. Um, and for the chance to have a good life. Pretty much the exact same reasons that your ancestors probably came here as well. Well, my dad came here, he didn't really know much of anything. Um, and so first day he comes, he steps off the plane, happens to be the day that Elvis died. And so uh, he looks at the newspaper, the newspaper says, the king is dead. <laughs> and my dad says, oh well, I have a lot to learn. I thought they were a democracy. And so that's how they started. They started with pretty much nothing. And, and uh, my mom and my dad, when they got here, uh, they really did have nothing. I don't know if you remember, but back in the 70s, maybe even in the 80s, when you went to McDonald's and you got a Big Mac, there was like a styrofoam container and they had like a little cardboard thing to keep the Big Mac standing up straight. Um, well, they used to wash those out and clean them and use them as their dishes because they really had nothing. Um, my dad would, whatever money he made, he was enlisted in the Navy, so he didn't make that much up until he got into the further ranks. Um, uh, but whatever he made, he'd send him most of it back home because that's what sons do. They take care of their family in our culture. Um, so he, he ultimately became a, an officer. He switched over to um, the officer side and he spent 24 years serving the U.S. Navy. Um, so my family was one which very much said, you know, you are a part of this nation. You're supposed to protect and defend this nation because it's taking care of you. Um, and so we were a strong Muslim American family. At the same time though, my mom always told me um, as I was getting older that I was to be an ambassador for Islam. Whenever someone sees me, she'd say, she says, they're, they're not going to see you and think, ah, here's a good student or here's an American. Even though you are those things, they're going to see you and they're going to think you are a Muslim. And so you are supposed to be an ambassador for Islam. Wherever you go, you have to speak the truth. No matter the consequences, you have to be truthful. You have to be known as the most truthful out of all your friends. You can never curse. You can, you can never give a bad image to your family. In fact, every elder that you see when you're outside or at school, you have to treat them as if they are your parents. So that when I come to school for an open house or for a meeting, that your teachers will tell me that Nabil is the most respectful boy in the class. That is how my mom told me to, to live my life and to exemplify um, my being. And so as, as we continue to grow, I mean, my mom, she was very, very, very much, uh, having been a daughter and a granddaughter of missionaries, very, very much in tune with raising us in the Islamic manner. Before I learned English, now I was born and raised in the United States, but before I learned English, my mom had taught me how to read the Arabic scriptures so that I could recite the entire Quran in Arabic before I even knew English. 
That's how important it is to just be able to recite the Quran. I mean, there were blessings, according to my family, you know, and most Muslims, it just blesses the house when you recite the Quran in Arabic, even if you don't know what it means. When I would wake up in the morning, my mom had taught me, Nabil, first thing when you wake up in the morning, pray, Alhamdulillah, ahi ahiyana ba'dama amatana wa alayhi nushur. You know what that means? Neither did I. But I prayed it anyway. It was because it was, it was a blessing to just pray these prayers. Later on, my mom taught me exactly what it meant. It meant, thank you, Lord, for waking me up from sleep, which is a kind of death. So every morning, you would wake up and you'd thank God for waking you up. And so at the very beginning, before my feet touched the ground, it was remembrance of Allah. And then as I'd walk to the bathroom to do the ceremonial washings, because you know, there's five daily prayers that Muslims pray. And before they pray those daily prayers, or ceremonial washings. Well, even while you're doing the ceremonial washings, you recite little memorized prayers called du'a. And so I'd be reciting prayers constantly, all the time. And that was, that was how I knew to live my life. And my childhood was, some of my earliest memories and my fondest memories are uh, when we would uh, wait for the new moon to come up before Eid uh, and before Ramadan. Ramadan is a Muslim holy month. And as you know, the Islamic calendar is based on the lunar calendar. And so we would go outside and we'd wait for the clouds to clear up and we'd try to see if it was a new moon. And it was, you know, a very, very exciting time because, oh, it's about, it's about to be Ramadan, we're about to fast. Uh, I, I'd imagine it's the same kind of excitement that kids have right before Christmas. Although we didn't get a ton of presents. You guys totally looked out. Um, <laughs> but it was the same kind of excitement. It's like, oh, you know, the moon's about to come. And if we saw the moon, we'd pray a prayer. Ramadan is going to start. We'd go to sleep because we'd wake up early in the morning so that we could begin our fast. And our father would wake us up at 3.30, 4 o'clock sometimes, and we'd pray that the Hajjid prayers, and then we'd eat a large breakfast. You can eat a lot before the fast. Eat as much as you can before you start fasting. Um, and then the fast would start, and at the end of the day, we would end the fast. And after the fast, we'd come together as a community. We'd, all, we'd always open our fast with dates, and then we'd pray the prayer, and then we'd have a, a full meal. Um, so these were some of the fondest memories I had growing up. And so you might ask me, you might say, Nabil, you're telling me that you had a life devoted to praising and pursuing God. Uh, you had a good reputation in society. You had a very well, uh, tightly knit family. You had love, joy, happiness. What in the world could you need, right? Because religion in your faith is about making good people who do good things, isn't it? Well, I would say that most Muslims and most Christians would say no to that. It's not just about living a good life. It's also about what you believe. It's also about why you're here. It's also about why you were made and who is God. All these questions really matter to Muslims and to Christians alike. There's a lot in common between Muslims and Christians when it comes to their theism. But there's a lot of differences too. And so I wanted to share with you exactly what it meant to believe Muslim beliefs. My mom and my dad taught me that there is one God, Allah. And that God was, this, this version of God, this, this precise description of God was given by a man named Muhammad. Now Muhammad came 600 years after Jesus, and he came 600 years away from Jesus. So Muhammad is in Arabia, uh, 7th century AD, and he preaches monotheism. Now that's a big deal, because at that time in Arabia, in Mecca, which was where Muhammad was preaching, polytheism was the source of commerce. Let me explain that to you. There in Mecca there was a place called the Kaaba, and there were 360 gods around the Kaaba, idols around the Kaaba. People came from all over Arabia to worship at the Kaaba, and they would bring their materials with them, they'd bring their goods, and lots of trade would happen, and that was the economy of the city. And so for Muhammad to stand up in that milieu and say, no, there is one God, he faced a lot of potential oppression. And Muslims are very, very proud about that. They're very, very proud about their monotheism. And they will say that they are true monotheists. And they will look at Christians and they'll say, Christians are not true monotheists. They believe in a triune God. We believe in one unified God, Allah. Allah is supposed to be unknowable. He's, he, you, can't, you can't know about him unless he reveals himself to you through his angels, to, through his prophets, in inscribed books that he inspires. That's how you know about Allah. Otherwise, he's so big, he's so great, you can't know about him. You're just supposed to worship him and do good deeds, and you're supposed to serve him. He is the Rabb. He is the Malik. He's the Lord. He is the owner. And you're the slave. You're the Abd. You're the Abdullah. You're the slave of Allah. That's, that is the position that you have as a Muslim. And you're supposed to please him. Now, there are lots of Muslims who do good works out of love for Allah, but 
the vast majority of Muslims I knew growing up did good deeds just so that they could please their God, so that they could earn their favor with Him. And that makes a lot of sense because Muslim soteriology, in other words, the way Muslims are saved, is they think they have to do more good deeds than bad deeds. If you've done more good than bad, then at the end of times, God will allow you into heaven. And so to them, if you ask a Muslim, what's the most important part of your faith for you, they will say, oh, it's the five pillars of Islam. To proclaim that there is one God and that Muhammad is his messenger. To pray the five daily prayers. To, to pay alms. To fast. To go on pilgrimage. These actions please God. And they are the central part of what we're supposed to do as Muslims. That's what matters most. So you see, the actions, you're supposed to earn your favor with God. is very, very important as a Muslim. So to sum it up, um, take a look at the slides here. Allah is God and Muhammad is his messenger. Performing the five pillars pleases Allah and if we are good Muslims, we will go to heaven. That's basic Islamic belief. But is it true? That's what really, really matters to Muslims and to Christians. If, you, if you're able to go to a Muslim and say to him, Muhammad never existed. No, no, by the way, Muhammad certainly existed. But if you're able to prove to a Muslim Muhammad never existed, that Muslim would stop being Muslim because his message is false. He believes that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. Same thing with the Quran. If, if you can prove to a Muslim the Quran was never revealed by God, then that Muslim would have to leave Islam because it's not true. And we have something analogous in Christianity, do we not? If Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain, and we are most of all to be pitied. In other words, if the resurrection did not happen, Christianity is false, and we are the most, most to be pitied. I mean, it would be just stories we tell ourselves to feel good if Christ didn't actually rise from the dead. But it's the fact that he did in history, Jesus Christ, a real man, did die on the cross and really did rise from the dead. It's that fact that grounds our faith in truth and gives us real hope and real meaning and real purpose. And so, as a Muslim then, truth really, really mattered. I remember when, um, when I was approached back in high school by a friend, her name's Betsy. I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, she, was, she was on fire for the Lord. I just thought she was crazy. Um, <laughs> but now I know she was on fire for the Lord. Um, she approached me and she said, Nabil, do you know Jesus? She wanted to share the gospel with me. My parents had taught me, Nabil, anytime anyone tries to preach the gospel to you, well, that wasn't the words they used, they said, if anyone tries to share Christianity with you, you share Islam with them. And so she comes up to me, Betsy does, and she says, do you know Christ? And I say, yeah, yeah, I do. I know that Jesus is virgin born. The Quran tells me so. I know that Jesus heals lepers and cures the dead and uh, the deaf and the blind and can raise the dead. I know he's the Messiah. The Quran tells me all this. But I also know that Jesus is not God. And she responds, of course he's God. You know, that's, that's the center of our faith. Jesus is Lord. I said, okay, I will grant you all four Gospels. I will grant you the Gospels. Show me where Jesus claims to be God. And without fail, Betsy, along with everyone else, was not able to defend the deity of Christ. Here's what she said. She said, Nabil, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. Is that not clear that Jesus is claiming to be God? And I said, no, it's not clear. Because in the same book, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says that he prays for the disciples to be one, just as he is one with the Father. So Jesus is praying for the disciples to be unified in spirit, just as he's unified in spirit with the Father. See, he's, he's clarifying exactly how he is one with God. He's unified in spirit. And I said, in case that's not clear enough to you, don't forget that in John, Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. Well, if the Father is greater than Jesus, how can Jesus be God, right? Well, what about in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus says he could do no miracles in Galilee because of their lack of faith? You're telling me God can't do miracles? Or how about Mark chapter 13, where Jesus says that he does not know when the end of times is? Are you telling me that God does not know when the end of times is? This doesn't make any sense at all. And right around now, she had this deer in the headlights look about her. And so I said to her, if you want to know about real truth, you come talk to me when you're ready, I'll tell you about Islam. And so I turned around her effort in sharing the gospel and made it into my own dawah. And I shared Islam with her. See, truth matters. Truth does matter. And I constantly challenged people in the truth. And it wasn't until I met somebody in college that I had a fair response. 
This was my first year in college, 2001, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. And I ran into a friend when we were at a public speaking and debate tournament. I was on the forensics team, and uh, my, uh, my whole team had come, and most of the team uh, at this tournament had gone out. They went out because, you know, it was the night before, they were going to party, they went drinking, they went clubbing, some of them had brought drugs with them, so they all went out. My parents had taught me never to do anything like that, so I stayed back, and if the whole team went fine, I'm staying by myself. But one other guy stayed behind, and so we decided to room together, we became friends. And his name was David. And as the night progressed, I saw him pull out a Bible. And I thought, all right, another opportunity to take down a Christian. <laughs> and so I said, David, you realize that book you're reading is horribly corrupt. And he says, well, do care to share. And I said, well, Jesus spoke in Aramaic, right? And then the early church spoke Hebrew. So already, whatever they're talking about is a translated version. But then, the whole New Testament is written in Greek. So you've got a translation of a translation by the time you get to the New Testament. But not only that, the, the main Bible, the one that the church used for the longest period of time, was the Vulgate. It was the Latin version. For over a thousand years, they used the Latin version. So you've got a translation of a translation of a translation. And then from Latin, it went to German. And from German is where it came to English. And that's why you have the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, the who knows what V. You got so many Vs, you don't know which one of them is the Word of God. And David said, Nabil, let me tell you something. We have in our possession today over 5,500 Greek New Testament manuscripts with which we can reconstruct the entire New Testament. And if we didn't have any of the Greek New Testament manuscripts, we have over 10,000 Latin New Testament manuscripts. If we didn't have any of them, we have 8,000 Coptic Syriac manuscripts. If we didn't have any of them, we've got 36,000 quotations of the New Testament. All of these by themselves are enough to recreate the entire New Testament. And the people who wrote the New Testament were the disciples, and these people were multilingual. They could understand Aramaic, they could understand Greek, they could hear in one and write in another without losing the message whatsoever. I said, David... You're making this stuff up. <laughs> because I've talked to so many Christians and not a single one of them has said that before. And he said, try me. Let's do it. Let's, let's study this together. Let's, let's look into these things together. And I said, let's do it. And so we became friends. I mean, we, from that point on, we did like everything together. We went, I was doing pre-med, he was doing biology. So we signed up for the same classes. We'd make fun of professors together. You know, we would, we would study for tests together. We took chemistry together. I mean, we did everything together. And in that context of friendship, I know he's going to take a bullet for me if the time ever arises, and I would do the same for him. So when he shares the gospel with me, and when he tries to tear down my faith, I know he's doing it because he loves me. And he's trying to provide me with his truth. And when I do the same for him, I try to tear down his faith and give him my own message. It's because I love him. See, in the context of friendship, you can accomplish a lot. You can really challenge one another. And so we did. I came to a quick realization that there are three things that I would have to investigate if I were going to look into the Christian message. And those three things are, number one, whether Christ is Lord. Number two, whether he died on the cross. And number three, whether he rose from the dead. I got this from Romans chapter 10, verse 9, where Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him, resurrection, from the dead, death on the cross, then you will be saved. Death, deity, resurrection. If Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead to prove what he said, which is that he is God, then Christianity is true. And so we started looking into these things. And I came up with a quick conclusion about the New Testament. And by quick, I mean it took me a year. But I figured out that the New Testament is truly accurate to what it originally said. If you study the history of the New Testament, you study the manuscripts, and you take a look at the evidence that we have, what they say today is what they have always said. Well, I turned to David and I said, all right, David, we have the New Testament message here. It's, it's still accurate to what it says, but it doesn't look like Jesus claims to be God anywhere in there. Where does he claim to be God? It took me a while. But I began to realize that when I read the New Testament the way it's supposed to be read, from the perspective of those who understand the Old Testament, then Jesus very clearly claims to be God. I didn't want to go to John. Most people said, ah, look at John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory of the only begotten. Look, clearly Jesus is claiming to be God here. 
Well, number one, no, it's not Jesus talking, that's John talking. But number two, that's the Gospel of John. That's really, really late. I want to look at the beginnings of Christianity. I want to see how from the very first part of the Christian message, Jesus is proclaimed as God. And so I went to the first Gospel, the Gospel of Mark. And it was precisely there where I read Mark chapter 14, verse 62, which when I understood what that verse was, it blew my mind. Here Jesus claims to be the Son of Man from Daniel. He claims to be the I Am from Exodus. And he claims to be the one sitting at the right hand of the power from Psalms 110, verse 1. Jesus very clearly claims to be God in Mark chapter 14, verse 62, when you understand his context. And so I said, all right, fine. Well, how do we know he died on the cross? Did he actually die on the cross? Because the Quran told me Jesus did not die on the cross. The Quran says... In chapter 4, verse 157, We killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them. So as a Muslim, I believed what the Quran told me. Jesus did not die on the cross. But Christians think Jesus certainly died on the cross. So this was a good litmus test right here. Which one's true? Which one's false? So I said, I'm going to study Jesus' death on the cross from a historical perspective. I want to see, did he actually die on the cross? And no matter how you look at it, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, Jew, Buddhist, however you look at it, if you're a historian and you're studying the evidence of Jesus' life, you have to conclude that he died on the cross. Every scholar who studies Jesus' life concludes that Jesus died on the cross. In fact, what they say is that if we can know anything about Jesus' life, it's that we know he died on the cross under Pontius Pilate. And the third thing, the the issue of the resurrection, did Jesus rise from the dead? Again, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the Christian faith is in vain. So how can can I know whether Jesus rose from the dead? Well, as luck would have it, God brought to town a debate. It was a debate on whether Jesus rose from the dead. It was between a Christian named Michael Lacona and a Muslim, Shabir Ali, both very respected in their fields. And as I was watching the debate, I was still a Muslim, as I was watching the debate, I concluded that the Christian case was far stronger. And I'm not the only one who concludes that. The argument that he uses, the minimal facts argument, an atheist by the name of Michael Martin, he's a very well-known atheist philosopher, says that the minimal facts defense for the resurrection is the strongest defense for the resurrection that has ever been provided in history. And so I stepped away from the evidence. I said, let me back it up. You know, what, what, what I believe truly does matter. I want it to be true. Let me take a look at this. I began to realize that the case for Christianity was very, very strong. But I didn't accept it. And this is hard to explain, but the reason I didn't accept it was because of subconscious factors. There was a lot I would have to give up if I were to become a Christian. I didn't realize this. This wasn't at the tip of my head. But there was a lot I was going to have to give up. The biggest one, right? Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran makes it very clear If you believe Jesus is God, you are going to hell. Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran. It's classified as the only unforgivable sin. Shirk. Believing someone other than Allah is God. And the example that's given there is Jesus. So if I'm wrong about this, I'm going to hell. Forever. That didn't quite bother me as much as the other two, though. The next one was... Muslims, if they leave their Islamic faith, even here in the United States, they are often killed for it. Now, around the world, definitely, all four schools of Sunni thought believe in the law of apostasy, Sunni being one of the major divisions of Islam. All three schools of Shia thought believe in the law of apostasy. Under certain circumstances, you can be killed for leaving your faith. But even here, that very year, 2004, a family in New Jersey was stabbed to death because they accepted Christ and left Islam. But the biggest issue for me was that if I, as the only son in my family, accepted Christ, my family would feel like I had stabbed them in the heart. I mean, my mom and my dad, who loved me so much, who cared for me, who raised me, who gave up everything for me, would feel like I was attacking them. You have to understand, Islam for Muslims is more than just a set of beliefs, it's their identity. And our parents were not just followers of Islam. They, they lived Islam. Islam was their life, as it was mine. And to leave it would be like betrayal. I didn't realize this. This wasn't something I was consciously thinking. I just looked at the evidence and I said, oh, I'm not convinced. But the thing that was keeping me from being convinced was the cost that I would have to pay subconsciously. And so I began to pray. And I prayed fervently. 
And I prayed to God. I said, God, I have come to a point where I realize that I cannot figure out who you are. You have to tell me who you are. And if you will tell me to be a Christian and to follow Jesus, I will follow you. And if you tell me to stay a Muslim, I will follow you. Just give me a vision. Give me a dream. Give me something so that I know you're telling me what's the truth. And he did. He gave me a vision and he gave me three dreams over the course of a few months. And I can't go into the details today because you guys got in for free, right? If you paid, I'd give you details. <laughs> I can't give you details today. But I will tell you this. Through the vision and through the dreams, I realized that I had been given an invitation into heaven and the only way I could accept that, inv uh, the only way I could get into heaven is if I accepted that invitation, the gospel message. And that's the only way I would be saved. Otherwise, I would be lost. God made this abundantly clear to me through dreams and visions, as he does with many Muslims around the world, by the way. And it was at that point that I was able to get away from the argumentation, get away from the, 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 the debates and all that, and just really focus on the message. I couldn't hear the gospel message before this point. I, it, it just did not make sense to me. But at this point, when I realized how much was at stake and God was showing me things and I had evidence and I had spiritual guidance, now I heard the message. And the Christian message is this. We have separated ourselves from God, our loving Father, through our sins. Now, as a Muslim, that didn't make any sense to me because as a Muslim, I believe that if you do bad deeds, you can just do good deeds and you'll kind of cover them up. It'll be, it'll be taken care of, you know? If you, if you run through one red light, stop at the next one twice, you know? You'll, you'll be okay. You know, just, it's all okay. You know, at the end, just do more good than bad and you'll be fine. But what I realized when I really listened to the Christian message and understood it, I realized that sin is not like that at all. In fact, what, what makes sin so devastating is that God is holy. What does holy mean? Holy means set apart. It means God is above, is beyond. He's set apart from everything. And who is God? God is life. God is love. God is goodness. God is joy. God is hope. God is peace. God is purpose. And if I sin, what I am doing is I am intentionally removing myself from all of that. I'm removing myself from life, from love, from joy, from hope, from peace, from purpose. I am taking myself away from the source of all goodness when I sin. I am destroying my soul because sin is devastating. It's not just I can do more good things than bad. No, I'm supposed to do good anyway. The sin destroys you. I heard that message and I grasped it. And then I realized, wait a minute. How can I... Are you telling me that I have separated myself from God? How can I bring myself back? I can't. I cannot bring myself back. But God knows that. And God knew that from the creation of the world. And He loves us so much that He is willing to take my sins. These are the things that I did against Him. These are the things that I did to Him, telling Him I wasn't going to follow Him. These are the things where I put my desires above my Creator's desires. He's willing to take those very things upon Himself because He loves us that much. This doesn't make any sense to the Muslim mind. It, it, it took me a long, long time to grasp it. It made no sense. Because I couldn't envision God leaving His throne. God is up there in heaven somewhere being worshipped by angels surrounded by light and love and, and, and bliss and that's where God is. Why in the world would He come here? He never would come here. He's too majestic for that. But the Christian message tells us that God did not consider His majesty something to grasp, something to hold on to. This is Philippians 2. He did not consider His place, His status, greater than His love for us. Are you telling me that the one who created the expanse of the universe, you guys live in Colorado, you can look up in the sky, you can see the stars bright as day at nighttime, and they're gorgeous, and there are billions of stars out there. You're telling me that the God who made and placed every single one of those in the sky, who knows 
exactly how long they're going to be there, exactly how long they have been there, exactly how bright their light is, exactly how hot they burn. The God who knows all of those, every single star ever made from the beginning of the universe till the end, He knows all of them. He placed them there as easily as by thinking about it. That God knew me and created me exactly the way He made me for a reason. And he knew that I would rebel against him, and yet he entered into this world, into this dirty, filthy, sinful world. Why? That kind of love makes no sense. And, and then when he came, did he come as a king? Did he come as a prince? Did he come with all kinds of riches? No, he came and was born to two kids in a manger and grew up as a carpenter, working with his hands, serving other people, living and becoming friends with fishermen, people who couldn't even make it through school, and those people who he poured himself into turned around and betrayed him, one of them with a kiss, so that he would have to go to his death. And what kind of death? You're telling me that our God was willing to suffer death on a cross? What is death on a cross? Is that bad? They had invented the most humiliating, painful way to kill someone at exactly the moment in history where God says, yes, that death is still worth it. When they whip you before putting you on the cross, they had determined exactly how to do it so that medically you would be in your most vulnerable state. They took a tail, a cat of nine tails is what it was called, a Roman whip, and they put little leather, dumb, uh, leather balls at the end of them, and they'd put metal dumbbells and shards of bone on these leather balls so that when they hit your skin the, the metal dumbbells would cause your blood vessels to vasodilate bringing more blood to the surface of your skin so that when the bones would latch into your skin and rip your skin off you would bleed profusely and you'd lose all energy and they do that across your entire body so that by the time you get to the cross, you have no energy left when they drive nails through your nerves and destroy your hands and your feet. And every time you have to breathe one of your last rattling breaths on the cross, you have to scrape a back that is devoid of skin up and down splintered wood for each breath. God did that? He loves us that much? It's incomprehensible. But we know it's true. We know it's true. The resurrection happened. Jesus claimed to be God, then He died on the cross, and He proved it by rising from the dead. God died on the cross. That God who made the universe suffered that death because He loves us that much. That is the Christian message. That is worth believing. Now, if you ask me, Nabil, you had a perfect life. You had a family that loves you. You, had, you, had, you were becoming a doctor. You had, you had a good place in society. Everything was great for you. Was it worth it? Absolutely it was worth it. I would do it a hundred times over again. Today, my, mo my mom and dad didn't come to my wedding. Every single time I see a video of a son dancing with his mother at his wedding, I have to think that it was worth it. Every time I see parents lovingly hug their children and say, we're proud of you, I have to think it was worth it. Because it was worth it. And if I have to die the same kind of death that Christ died in order to proclaim this message of hope to other people who are here, that would be the greatest honor I could ever have. You know, we sent one missionary per million Muslims into the rest of the world over the past few decades, and God looked at us and said, well, since you're not going, we're going to bring them here. And so he brought Muslims to Denver, Colorado. There's tons of them. And you are here. You, you, why, why didn't we go to heaven, right? Why didn't we go to heaven as soon as we became believers? God left us here for the specific purpose of loving others and leading them to Christ and sharing God's love with them and letting them know what it means to be loved by God. That is why we're here. That is why we're here. And God equips us to do that. And there's hope and purpose and peace and love in that. And that is the gospel. 
That is the Christian message. And it is worth absolutely everything. So if you have any Muslim friends that you know of, they need to know. They need to know. They're just like the rest of us before we knew the Lord. They need hope. They need life. They need purpose. They need meaning. They need love. Don't be afraid just because they look different or they eat different things. That is no excuse to hold back this kind of love. This kind of love should not be held back by anything, and indeed it's not held back by anything. The gospel conquers all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how can we begin to thank you for what you've done for us? How can we begin to thank you that you're not a God who would sit on a throne and look down on people and just judge them in a way that would leave them hopeless, but rather in judging us and our sins, you decided to send your Son as our Savior to restore us. You decided to restore. We sinned against you. You had nothing to gain from that, but you loved us so much that you suffered for us so that we could be made whole and be born again. How can I not proclaim your praises, Lord? God, I pray that, that these truths would just revolutionize our lives, God. That our lives would be living reflections of you, that you just pour through us, that you use us as vessels for your Holy Spirit to just come. And so that when we're walking around, Lord, that people would see us and they'd say, that is a God that I want to follow. That is a God that's worth giving everything for. Lord, that's our prayer that you just pour through us. God, I pray that everyone here today, everyone would know that you brought them here for a reason. You brought them here to hear the gospel, to consider their own heart, and to consider whether they are taking part in the glorious privilege of being able to share the good news. Thank you so much, Lord. We are not worthy, but you've made us worthy through your Son and his blood. Thank you so much, God. God, I pray that we would be real and that we would love and live to the full. I pray that our lives would be a reflection of yours on this earth. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.